Karaka. It's the 27th of July, 2022. For the last two days we've been studying a Dhamma of the uh, Satipatthana Sutta um, with the uh, foundation of the body, focusing on that. So this We can start off with having mindfulness of the breath, the in-breath and the out-breath, what we call anapanasati, and also mindfulness of the body and the movements of the body as well, its postures, standing, sitting, walking, lying down, having mindfulness of those in this present moment. If we're turning left, we're turning right, we're speaking, we're listening, even thinking, we have mindfulness. And this is something that we need to train in because the habit that we have is that when there are thoughts, then these come to the brain and then the brain gives the orders for the body to move, to walk, to sit, to stand, to lie down. So when the mind sends these thoughts to the brain, the brain becomes aware of them and the nervous system in the body is functioning well, then the brain sends an order to the body and the body is able to follow that, follow the desires of the mind. But if there is problem with that nervous system, then even though the mind may want to stand or sit or walk or lie down and give that order or to speak, um, then the body won't follow that order. So if that's the case, then we have mindfulness, we know that as well. So we can also contemplate this body in terms of the 32 parts, see it as something that's unattractive, or contemplate how the body needs to die. And these are all methods to bring the mind to peace, what we call samatha kamatana. There's also the ten asuba recollections, uh, seeing the body pass away as just being a skeleton or being a bag of blood or of maggots, just a thin bag that's filled with unclean things. And in the suttas, they talk about seeing this body as a dead body as a corpse, like it's been tossed away in the charnel ground. And seeing how it gets swollen and how it turns green. And that's because the blood can't flow conveniently like it once could. And so the bacteria, they perform their duty of working away at digesting and decaying the body until it breaks and animals come to consume it as food. And in the end, the ligaments which once held the body together break, and the bones get scattered about. Slowly these bones, too, fall apart, decay, and the body returns to the earth, just the earth element. The water element disappears, the air element fades, goes away, the fire element breaks apart. And when we see this, we can get a sense of dismay, of disillusionment in this body, this body which we love so much. So when it dies, we can kind of imagine that and contemplate that, that it's just like a frog or a toad that we may see dead on the road. This body which we take to be me, to be a self, and the conceit that arises from that, the greed, hatred, delusion that comes from that. But in the end, when the air isn't flowing in this body, the breath isn't working for just a short amount of time, then this loses all of its value. So this is contemplating in terms of the ten asupa kamatanas. So whatever kamatana object 
meditation object that we like, then we should train in that. And perhaps we'll see an imiter, a visual image, um, which can stick in our mind's eye. And we recollect that and bring that up into our hearts, bringing the mind to peace. For some people, they're of the temperament to have wisdom, and they don't like contemplating the super, the unattractive nature of the body. They feel as though it's too disgusting. When they contemplate this, then anger and hatred arises in their minds. So they should contemplate the body as being elements instead, see it as being a heap of earth, water, fire, and air. So it's the same body, the same body that stands, sits, walks, lies down, this body. If we contemplate the 32 parts, it's this body. The ten asuba recollections, it's this body. The four elements, it's this body. It's just we're viewing it in a different light. We're bringing up uh, a different meditation object to view it with. But we have mindfulness in this body all the same. And make that mindfulness strong. So we can see the hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth and skin, the bones, as just being the earth element. So we don't view it as a suba, as unattractive, but rather as the earth element. Then there's the blood, we can view that as being the water element. So not as being unattractive in this case, but rather just as the water element. And then there's the fire element, which gives heat to the body, which digests the food. And there's the air element, the in-breath, the out-breath, the gases in the body, and also the empty spaces in this body. So these are the elements of earth, water, fire, and air. And this too is another method to bring our minds to peace, to gather them into samadhi making that samadhi strong, using these four elements. And when there's a firmness to our samadhi, then perhaps joy arises from seeing the truth. You see that the body really is just four elements like this. Before, we hadn't known that, we hadn't actually seen that. And if people have very refined samadhi, then they may even be able to perceive the current of the fire element flowing through the body. There's also the current of the air element that flows through the body as well. And this is contemplating on a deeper level. But in the beginning, we don't have to view it in this way. We can just see it as being a heap of earth, water, fire and air bringing the minds to peace like this, so that joy and happiness arises, so that we see clearly how this is just a heap of elements, in a way that we'd never seen before. Or perhaps we view it as a suba, as unattractive, and the heart fills up with joy, becomes contented through seeing it as being not beautiful, then the mind becomes beautiful, becomes bright and clear. Through seeing this, through seeing the beauty in a ghost's carcass, or we could say a carcass of a suba, a carcass that's unattractive. If the mind sees it as being beautiful, then the mind itself becomes unattractive, it becomes dark. But if the mind is beautiful, then it's bright, bright through seeing the truth, through having samadhi, through having this joy. So when we practice like this, constantly, then we can see the body as being a heap of earth, water, fire, and air. And then we see that earth element break apart. And here we can understand uh, anicca, this inconstancy, this change. How it's something that doesn't endure, something that needs to decay and break apart. 
So initially we contemplate the earth element, see the earth element, and this is samatha gamatana, this calming uh, method. But when we see the body and see this earth break apart into emptiness, then we see into not-self. So we see how when we separate all these elements out, then they're all just empty. So in the Heart Sutra, this is how they put it, they say that uh, form is an emptiness, and emptiness is in form. So this emptiness is there within form, because form is empty. And so when we separate out form, then what's left is emptiness. So we see that uh, therefore, um, emptiness, or within form, there is this emptiness. And emptiness is there within form. But in the present state that we're in, we don't see it like that. We can't separate these elements out into emptiness. So we see it as just being a form. There's earth, water, fire and air coming together. And we take that as form and take that form as a self, as being me. And we also view it as being beautiful as well. And so these wrong views, they um, overlay each other like this. So we need to contemplate. So in the beginning we have mindfulness, with the standing, walking, sitting, lying down, eating, drinking, speaking, listening, thinking. We have mindfulness, mindfulness over everything that we do. And this can help us a lot. You try to see the body as being unattractive. Because if we see it as being beautiful, um, then the mind will give rise to a liking for it. So we need to try and pull the mind away from that and into samadhi. Because if it maintains that liking, then it won't be at peace a lot of proliferations will arise. So we need to train our minds like this until they gain an understanding. Until we gain an understanding of what we've read in the scriptures. And really what's there in the scriptures is correct. But if we can't do it yet, if we can't actually practice in the way that's outlined, then we may claim that what's there is incorrect. So for myself, before I read the Satipatthana Sutta, and I read this and I tried to do it, but I wasn't yet able to do it. I was also listening to the teachings of the Krubhajans as well. But when we train and practice, and when those teachings actually arise for us, when they actually happen for us, then we understand that this is how it actually is. Before we hadn't really seen that, and but now there's this joy and this happiness that's really coming up for us, this peace that's really arising, and we're able to extract the delusion within the heart, the form, the liking towards this heap of elements. If we have that liking, then it makes cultivating samadhi really difficult. Because sometimes there will be this liking, sometimes disliking, there will be some doubts as well, and the mind will be in a bit of a mess. But if we're going to put this really easily, just have mindfulness, recite Buddha a lot, do this often, really put in the effort to do this. And if we can maintain that, then samadhi needs to arise. So we can look at the body as just being a heap of elements. And when those elements separate out, then there's no self there, is there? And it's really amazing when we see that. Initially, we listen to this, this teaching on not-self, but we still have attachment to the self, to me. When we take some blood out of the body, 
then we can see that as being not self. But the blood that's still in the body we take to be my blood. But the blood itself it doesn't make any claims like this. It's just the mind that attaches to that and gives it that significance of being me. And so that's the same with the bones as well. We say that those bones belong to that person, and these bones are my bones. But this is just the attachment of the mind. It's the wrong views of the mind. When there's samadhi that's well established, however, then we can teach the mind and it will easily understand that this is not self, it's not me. And we can gain an understanding through this, that this is how it really is. And emptiness arises. And we see how there isn't really the self there. We gain a clear understanding. And it's like the things that bind us down the many ropes which bind us, that today I've cut one of those ropes, that one of them has been cut. And we feel a great sense of ease and spaciousness. And so this is what it's like when we contemplate one time, we're able to cut one of those ropes, and we feel that great sense of ease. And it's like the mind leaves this world, goes to another world, it transcends the world. Like we've got one foot on this side, and our other foot is on the other side. And this is the level of Gotara Pujita and Gotara Puyana. So you may read this in the scriptures and still have some doubts. And some people wonder why it is that those beings who have reached this level of Gotara Pujita, Gotara Puyana, why aren't they yet able to just go completely? You may gain the feeling that if I was in that state, then I would just go, I wouldn't come back. But the wisdom isn't yet enough at that point. So we need to try and gain these in- insights frequently. So it's kind of like people who come to the monastery, They have some faith that comes up, so they come. But then they go home again, and they just forget. And it may be many, many years that pass until they come back to the monastery again. But as people's faith grow, then they come more frequently. They come to uh, donate, and to take the precepts, to listen to the Dhamma, to sit in meditation, cultivating samadhi. And then as their faith grows and grows, then they come more and more frequently. And they feel like they want to stay for longer periods in the monastery and to practice here. And steadily they see the drawback and the harm of a mind which is unsettled. So they try to find the time to come. Maybe every two days they come once. And they gain a joy from that. So it's like the practitioners that are able to cut one of these ropes that bind us. And they feel that ease that comes from that. And they see that the path is really like this. And this is the way to do it. And so a lot of effort uh, comes up at that point. Because they've got this joy which is nourishing their hearts. And this nourishment, it's really important. Because if we don't have that happiness, we're not able to keep it up for a long time. If we don't have that happiness, if we don't enjoy what we're doing, then as we do it, we become fed up with it. And we don't have that energy to carry on. So this this stage, it's the pojanga, uh, the factor for awakening of joy, of pity. And then there's the virya bojanga, the bojanga of effort. And when there's peace arising in the heart, then this is pasadi, the bojanga of serenity. And when the mind isn't given to liking or disliking, 
This is the factor for awakening of upeka, of equanimity. And there's also mindfulness there. So this is the sati, pojanga factor. And sometimes there's contemplation into the Dhamma, to this body of being a collection of four elements, seeing it break apart, having knowledge arise within us, a knowledge which doesn't arise from thinking. And this is Dhamma Vijaya, this analysis of the Dhamma. So the Sati Patana is something that we should cultivate each day making our samadhi strong. Initially, kanaka samadhi, this momentary samadhi, and then upajara, this neighborhood samadhi, and then apana, access samadhi. So these are states which we have read about, but we can put them into practice and gain them as well. And then we contemplate and see clearly And at that point, we won't be bored with the practice. We listen to the Dhamma of the great teachers. And what we hear goes very deep into our hearts. And there's a profound understanding of it. And we're able to cut away at the defilements at this point. The many ropes that hold us down, you can cut these one at a time. And this... At this point, it depends upon our barami, our accumulated spiritual virtues, just how quickly this goes. Some people see just one time, and they're able to see to the highest level of Dhamma. If people's barami is full, they see into the Dhamma. And if they don't attain in this lifetime, then those with little barami, it will be seven more lives. But those of a medium amount of barami, it's three more lives that's left. And so the time frame differs between people. So there's, but when this happens, there's a clarity of our vision, a knowledge that arises, a brightness that comes up, and there are no more doubts. Because we know that in order to get to this point, then you have to follow this path, that there is this path, and we see that clearly, we understand that path well. So in training in the Satipatthanas, the foundations of mindfulness, then this is how it goes. We have mindfulness over the body like this. And there are many, many finer details to this practice. But in conclusion, We just have mindfulness over this body. If we have just a little bit of time to do this, then we should train all the same. Because it's not sure. And seeing the Dhamma is something that's not sure. But whatever the case, if we carry on practicing, we must see the Dhamma one day. So we should do this a lot, train in this a lot, really establish our efforts well. Because... This is something that isn't beyond our innate capabilities. It's not something that's beyond our sincerity of our hearts. To to gain the Dhamma, to see the Dhamma in this life. So may you set your hearts on this. Because the days and the nights are steadily passing by. And we should use this time that we have to cultivate goodness. And if we don't cultivate goodness, then what will we have? The people that gain a lot of things in this world, when they die, they need to leave a lot of things behind. Those who gain little just leave a little behind. But in the end, there's nothing left. We come empty-handed and we leave empty-handed. But the people who have wisdom, they will build up their barami before they pass away. And when they go, they'll take a good path. So may all of you set your hearts on this.